Frankie De Tori storming up to the line. Yes, Usta, daddy, we've done it, mummy. Frankie on fire. Frankie De Tori is going to make history on this wonder filly in Nabal. The Earth winner is the Breeders' Cup Turf winner, too. And for a Nabal, it's King George III. Frankie saluting the crowd, and what a champion he is. Frankie De Tori, seven out of seven. It's a history maker. Frankie. Few people are known by one name, but like Lester Pickett before him, Frankie de Tori has that recognition both in and out of racing. It's not just because of his record-breaking 36-year career as a jockey, but his happy-go-lucky persona that the wider public fell in love with. In all probability, we will never see his like again. And now, as Frankie prepares to bid farewell to British racing, his story will go down as one of racing's greatest tales. Lanfranco de Tori was born in Milan on December the 15th, 1970. His father, Gianfranco, was champion jockey 13 times in Italy. His mother, Mara, was a trapeze artist at the circus. A Juventus fan as a youngster, football rather than racing was young Frankie's first love, but that changed when his first pony, Silvia, came along. At the age of just 14, young Frankie was put on a plane to Luton Airport to start life with Luca Kumani in Newmarket. For one so young with virtually no grasp of English, those early months were daunting. But it wasn't long before the first trophy was in the cabinet. This is my first trophy, right? And not related to horse racing, I won the Donkey Derby in Newmarket in 1987. Frankie had his first ride as an apprentice jockey in Britain in April 1987. Two months later came his first winner, Lizzie Hare, at Goodwood in June. De Tori went on to ride eight winners in 1987 and 22 in 88, while spending his winters working in the United States. There he was entranced by the riding styles of some of the superstar riders, Angel Cordero in particular, who was the pioneer of the flying dismount, the celebration that was to become Frankie's trademark. 1989 was a breakthrough year for Frankie, riding out his claim and becoming Luca Kumani's stable jockey aged just 18. He rode 75 winners that season, equaling the apprentice record set by the great Eddie Hyde in 1956. The following year was again highly significant as de Tori became the first teenager since Lester Piggott in 1955 to ride 100 winners. A special victory was the first of his 81 Royal Ascot winners, coming in the form of Mark of Distinction in the Queen Anne Stakes. It was a great thrill. I had a dream run on the rail and he uh, done it very nicely. In September, Mark of Distinction gave de Tori his first Group 1 winner in the Queen Elizabeth II Stakes helped by his rider's poise and tactical acumen. Frankie dropped out behind a fast pace before memorably going head-to-head -head with Pat Eddery on Distant Relative to take the victory. It's Mark of Distinction and Distant Relative very close. Mark of Distinction on the far rail. Distant Relative, Mark of Distinction it is. The following year, de Tori won his first European Classic on Politane in the Prix du Jockey Club, cementing his position as one of the world's elite riders. 1992 brought a Gold Cup win on drum taps, but at the end of the year, there were two significant setbacks. First came a split with Kumani after he accepted an offer to ride in Hong Kong without notifying the trainer. Worse was to follow as he was cautioned by the Metropolitan Police for possession of a controlled drug, which the authorities in Hong Kong viewed dimly. The job offer was withdrawn. One of the underlying themes of Frankie's career has been a cast iron ability to bounce back from adversity and here that ability was tested in a major way for the first time. He showed his mettle by winning a second Ascot Gold Cup on drum taps and forming a new association with Ian Balding's sprinting superstar Lock Song. She seemed to thrive under de Tori's swagger, winning the Nunthorpe before taking the Prix de l'Abbé for the first time by a ridiculous six lengths. 
In 1994, Frankie took things to another level, registering his first British Classic victory, his first Breeders' Cup winner, and an extraordinary Flat Jockeys Championship, the first of three. His final tally of 233 winners was not far off Sir Gordon Richards' long-standing record of 269. There were major breakthroughs in his human relationships too. Firstly, owner Sheikh Mohammed called on Dittori services as Luca Kumani made up with his former stable jockey. That led to Frankie taking the ride on the Sheikh Mohammed-owned, Kumani-trained Barathea, who cruised to victory in the Breeders' Cup mile. It's Barathea who takes the lead in mid-stretch and with an explosive rally runs right by unfinished simp as Barathea goes on to a clear-cut and decisive victory. I couldn't believe it. When I came around the turn, it just picked the bridle off and it was just a matter of time when I was going to press the button. And I waited real good to be going to the straight and when I pressed the button, it delivered. And it took a real good one to get by me because he was flying. After the race, Dettori thrilled race goers with his first flying dismount. I mean, it all started basically in America in 94 after Barathea. Took it back to England, did not go down very well for a while. And then people started liking it. I carried on and now I'm slave of my own thing because if I don't do it, then boo. This look is a bit of fun and I stole it from Angel Cordero. Really. And all those years later, I'm still doing it. Go on, Frankie. But it was surely a first British classic which pleased Frankie most in this stellar year. This came courtesy of Oak's success aboard Balanchine, who was also to provide De Tory with his only Irish derby success at the Curra three weeks later. Frankie had strengthened his reputation and Sheikh Mohammed had his man. The Godolphin operation was in its infancy, but the two giants of horse racing were to prove an irresistible force for years to come. 1995 brought a second Oaks aboard Moonshell before a notable Royal Ascot winner for Queen Elizabeth II on Phantom Gold in the Ribblesdale Stakes. His Phantom Gold in the Queen's colours, Talanzia's charging at the leader. Phantom Gold swishes the tail, but she's a length clear and she'll hold on to win the Ribblesdale. The first couple of days were very long for me. All the boys have been uh, giving me a lot of stick. <laughs> My lip was getting bigger and bigger, but uh, <laughs> at the end I pulled one and uh, I'm delighted. Frankie was then handed the ride on derby winner Lamtara in the King George. Lamtara the far side gains the lead. Pentara is fighting back. Lamtara and Pentara stride for stride. Lamtara the derby winner, too good. Following that victory, the pair took the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe at Longchamp, the first of a record six wins in the race for De Tory. Another major success was a first St. Ledger victory aboard Classic Cliché, a success which was hugely significant statistically. Here's win number 1,000 in Britain for Frankie de Tory. The Ledger goes to Classic Cliché. And so too what may well be the greatest achievement in the history of horse racing, the Magnificent Seven at Ascot on September the 28th, 1996. Going through the card on one of the biggest days of the calendar was unprecedented, unlikely to ever happen again, and made Frankie into a household name. His first win came in a straightforward manner on the well-fancied Wall Street in the Cumberland Lodge stakes. And it's Wall Street for the money, wins the Cumberland Lodge half a length. Frankie hadn't fancied diffident at all in race two, the diadem stakes, but the horse chose a good day to deliver a career best performance. Diffident now putting in the big challenge. Lukai and Princess flying. Don't reckon he made it. It's tight though. Yes, yeah, the result of the photograph of first place. First, number four, diffident. Leg three was the Queen Elizabeth II stakes, where Mark of Esteem, on whom de Tory had won the 2,000 guineas, repelled superstar filly Bosra Sham. He's too good, the Colt, and it's Mark of Esteem who goes on to win the QE2 stakes. De Tory's tactical acumen helped land the fourth race aboard Decorated Hero, delivering him fast and late for the victory. It's going to be four out of four for Frankie de Tory as Decorated Hero goes on to win well by four lengths. 
Legs five and six were quite straightforward. Fatefully won the Rosemary Strakes in good style. And then Lock Angel, Lock Song's half-sister, won race six, the Blue Seal Stakes. It's six out of six for Frankie. His final mount, Fujiyama Crest, was an idol, hard to win with horse, but with history and huge bookmaker losses beckoning, Fujiyama Crest went off two to one favorite, having been available at double figure odds in the morning. In a dizzying atmosphere, Fujiyama Crest passed the post in front as Ascot went crazy. Frankie the Tory, seven out of seven, it's a history maker. His victory cost the bookmakers 40 million pounds. The cumulative odds were over 25,000 to one, yet it was in all truth a once in a million event. One of the greatest and least likely days in the history of all sport. I never thought it was possible to ride through the car in all my career and uh, doing an ASCO for a special day, I'm speechless. The Magnificent Seven changed Frankie's life forever, making him an overnight celebrity. Mainstream television wanted a slice of the Italian story and personality. He appeared on This Is Your Life and even co-presented Top of the Pops. He was in huge demand, taking over the airwaves with an unapologetic, unselfconscious desire to share his excitement. 1997 was a relatively quiet year on the track, but a landmark one in his private life, as he married wife Catherine in Newmarket that year, and their family soon grew, with five children, Leo, Ella, Mia, Tallulah and Rocco. This is when we got married, look at that, how young we were. We've been together 26 years, five children, a poor through hell, thick and thin, winning and losing. Everyone needs somebody strong behind them and she's definitely so strong with me. 1998 was chock full of great moments for Frankie. Chief among them was a tremendous Royal Ascot with seven winners, including victory aboard Kaif Tara in the Gold Cup. Kaif Tara and double trigger, the post looms, Kaif Tara near side, Kaif Tara won the Gold Cup. I think I get to like Ascot, you know, I think we should just cancel the rest. It's been a fantastic week. I mean, all our horses have been running out of their skin. When you hit that winning post, it's a great joy. Later that summer, Frankie replaced John Reed aboard Swain in his bid for back-to-back -back King George wins, and the pair produced a stunning display. Swain straining every sinew and holds on to win again, wins the King George two years running. Swain added the Irish champion stakes to his role of honour before lining up in the Breeders' Cup Classic staged at Churchill Downs. Frankie's ride on Swain would be heavily criticised. His mount challenged on the outside, but with De Tori relentless in his left-handed whip use, Swain drifted badly to his right, losing ground and ultimately the race. Silver Champ short lead, here comes Awesome again, who's flying in between horses, a wild finish to the classic! Awesome again has won! The backlash that followed was fierce, and Frankie's resilience would be called upon once more, and again, he was to find a way back. Indeed, 1999 was a golden year for Godolphin. They won a total of 18 Group 1 races with Frankie aboard 13 of them. His partnership with the Grey Day Lamy was to prove the cornerstone of the team's success. His victory in the King George, a notable highlight. His Day Lamy for Godolphin and Frankie de Tory storming up to the line to win the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Diamond Stakes. No contest. Day Lamy the winner. De Lamy followed up in the Irish Champion Stakes and ended his year by doing battle in the Breeders' Cup turf at Gulfstream Park. The ghost of Swain still hung over Frankie, certainly as far as the American press were concerned, but with the pressure gauge turned to maximum, De Tory came out fighting and silenced his critics with a superb display of horsemanship. Here comes De Lamy, unleashing an explosive rally, and well off them lengthening his stride, but De Lamy runs by them all, and De Lamy will win it going away. De Lamy by three on the wire. 
The year 2000 would prove to be a life-changing year for Frankie. He started the new millennium with the horse of a lifetime, who recorded an extraordinary victory in the Dubai World Cup. It's Dubai Millennium, he's absolutely pulverised this field. He's eight lengths in front and going further ahead. Dubai Millennium, a superb performance to win the Dubai World Cup, the world's richest horse race, and a great performance. Dubai Millennium by eight lengths. Frankie didn't know it at the time, but this would be the last time he would partner Dubai Millennium, owing to a catastrophic accident that would change his life and perspective in the most profound way. The charred remains of the aircraft lie at the spot where it crashed on the ground. Frankie de Tori and Ray Cochran managed to get out. The pilot did not. Both jockeys were airlifted to Addenbrooke's hospital, where they're now being treated for their injuries. The head of the fire service said it was a miracle that anyone survived the crash. Frankie and Ray Cochran were safe, but tragically, the pilot, Patrick Mackey, was killed. Eyewitnesses said it cartwheeled. Dottori and Cochrane somehow scrambled free. That was first of June. I uh, did a week in hospital with Ray Cochrane. He was in the plane crash with me. You know, you're full of morphine, you don't see anyone. And, you know, and then when I came out of hospital, then I realised, oh my God, you know, what I went through. And I was sitting at home, I watched the Epsom Derby, I was depressed. I had a cast on my leg because I broke my ankle. And uh, I said, let's say I'm getting up and doing something. So I humbled my way to watch Dubai Millennium win. You know, I had crutches and I remember humbling towards the paddock and everybody was started clapping in the paddock and I thought, God, the Queen must be here. So I got myself out of the way and actually looked around, they were all clapping to me. Uh, so that was a, was a good touch. And then Dubai Millennium absolutely shoot, shoot in and uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good day. Up towards the line, Dubai Millennium storms away for Jerry Bailey to win to the Prince of Wales' stakes. It was one way to, to get myself out and about and restart my rehabilitation to get back as soon as I could. Typical of Frankie, his return to riding came at Newmarket two months later with two rides and he won on both. He then ended the toughest of years with victory on Fantastic Light in the Hong Kong Cup. Fantastic light in front, great dance, Jim and Tony coming at him. Fantastic light for the Emirates Series, wins the Hong Kong International Cup. Fantastic light by a length and a half. Dittori bounced back with one of his best seasons in 2001, notching 17 Group 1 winners with both Fantastic Light and Saki making a huge imprint on world horse racing. Fantastic Light kicked things off with an impressive win in the Prince of Wales Estates at Royal Ascot. Godolphin's international standard bearer, Fantastic Light, wins the Prince of Wales Estates. It was a good horse. It was a bit quirky, I must say. He had these bad days, but in general, when he was good, he was really good. The pair then capped off a great year by winning the Breeders' Cup turf with great authority. Here comes Fantastic Light and Frankie de Tori, and they have swept to the lead. Fantastic Light holds on! Saki also put up three exceptional performances in 2001, the last of them coming in the arc when he was sensational giving Dittori arc number two and a 100th worldwide Group 1 victory. Then, famously, the pair went to Belmont Park in New York, where the clash between Saki and Tisnow would live long in the memory as one of the great Breeders' Cup classic races of all time. On the outside, Saki! In 2002 saw Frankie at something of a crossroads and his application came under scrutiny as he accepted a role as team captain on the BBC's flagship sports quiz, A Question of Sport. The BBC clearly enjoyed his ebullient personality, but some in the racing industry viewed his new celebrity role as a distraction from the day job. Yet on the track, Frankie still managed to achieve highly. He completed the 1,000 guineas Oaks double aboard Casia, and he won a second Prince of Wales' stakes on Grandera. 
He also enjoyed a joyfully unexpected third arc win on the completely unfancied Marion Bard. Falbrav then put the icy on the cake for the Italian with victory in the Japan Cup. Fighting away is Falbrav on the middle. Falbrav, Falbrav, turning back. It's Falbrav, and Frankie does it on the inside side of the It's close. This was Frankie's second success in the Tokyo showpiece, following his win aboard Singspiel in the 1997 renewal. I tell you what, that last furlong was a long furlong. <laughs> I was saying, get back, get back. <laughs> Dittori was to show that his own fires burned brightly over the next couple of years. Once again, Falbrav was to play his part in Frankie's success, this time in Hong Kong. Falbrav sprouts wings at the 150. Away goes a champion, two lengths in front. Wrecked again in fashion for the minor. What a swan song. Say goodbye to a star. Frankie clearly enjoyed his pre-Christmas performance in the Hong Kong Cup, and it appeared that his appetite was indeed as strong as ever. 2004 saw Dittori ride some huge winners, but arguably the most extraordinary achievement that year was to regain the Flat Jockeys Championship for a third and final time with 192 winners. However, the following two years saw the Godolphin operation under strain and big race winners were hard to find. In 2005, Shamadal gave Dittori and Godolphin a boost on French soil, winning both the Poule d'Essai de Poulain and the Prix du Jockey Club. And once again, Frankie proved his class on the international stage when partnering Al Kassed to Japan Cup victory. It's Frankie Dottori's race and getting home late. Hearts cry, hearts cry out of the ground. Did he get up? Don't know. But there was one big race winner that year that would cause unrest. When Frankie partnered the Coolmore own Scorpion to win the 2005 St. Ledger, Many eyebrows were raised as Godolphin's stable jockey had helped rivals Coolmore to another major success. Despite all these classic victories, the one race that still eluded Frankie was the Derby. In the 2006 Racing Post Trophy, he partnered Peter Chappelheim's authorised to success and his dream of a first Derby winner was ignited. There's going to be a huge shock here, authorised and Frankie in front. The next year, Authorised took the Dante in style and cemented his position at the head of the betting for the Epsom showpiece. What had proved so difficult to accomplish eventually fell into place with the minimum of fuss as Authorised stormed to Epsom glory. Frankie had won the derby at the 15th attempt, aged 36. His father was there to offer immediate congratulations and to present his son with a much-promised gift. So dad, uh, they used to have um, the Jockeys Awards every year, you know, Tuxedo, you know, Dicky Boy, all that. And uh, he used to open the safe, I used to get his famous watch out, and he used to dangle in front of my face. See son, see, one day if you win the Epsom Derby, you can have it. Like, and we wear it for, for the night, and off you go in the safe for one more year. Then the year after, again, see son, they say, if you win the Derby one day, I'll give it to you. And this way, and this bloody watch just kept on playing in my mind. I thought, you know, I, I actually want to win the derby to have this watch. I don't care about the dad, I just want the watch. And true to his word, dad was, dad had, a, had, a, uh, had to do something in his eye. And the only place they could fix it was in London, this surgeon. So he had to come over to get his eyes fixed. And funny enough, it was the year of authorised. And uh, I may, maybe he had six cents because he took the, he took the watch with him, and he, the horse wins, and uh, I've got the watch. And believe it or not, I've had it now what 15 years. I still haven't worn it, but this bloody watch <laughs> gave me nightmares for years. You know. Uh, here we go. Bless him. And Frankie was thrilled when Godolphin's Italian import Ramonti emerged as a champion that season. Ramonti's Queen Anne victory in June was massive as it was Godolphin's first Group 1 winner in Britain for three years. Ramonti was to follow that victory with a battling success in the Queen Elizabeth II stakes back at Ascot. Indeed, it seemed the more that got thrown at him, the more Ramonti liked it. And when asked to go again in the December of 2007 in the Hong Kong Cup, 
Ramonti delivered once more. It's fair to say that even 10 years on from the Swain debacle, Frankie was desperate to right that wrong, and his stateside fortunes would soon turn thanks to his old ally John Gosden's Ravens Pass in the 2008 Breeders' Cup Classic at Santa Anita. Gates open, fields sent on their way to the roar of the Santa Anita crowd. Frankie elected to follow US superstar Curlin, and those tactics worked a treat. Curlin now in deep order, he has to dig deep, and it's going to be Ravens Pass to win it. Ravens Pass, and Frankie Dottori have won the Classic. The despair of Swain and frustration of Saki melted away as Gosden and Dittori celebrated one of their most significant career successes with Hollywood royalty. Frankie Dittori celebrates the classic <laughs> win. <laughs> Bo cool. Derek, Frankie Dittori celebrating with Bo oh. Derek. And in typical style of Frankie Dittori, he's not bashful. <laughs> he's kissing everything. But that wasn't necessarily the happiest scene of 2008. This came at Doncaster six weeks prior. Sir Michael Stout had never won the St. Ledger despite 25 failed attempts, but he booked Dettori to ride Conduit with devastating effect. It's Conduit for Frankie Dettori and Sir Michael Stout's St. Ledger hoodoo is about to be put to bed. Frankie Dettori's fifth ledger and Sir Michael Stout's first. Frankie was able to celebrate St. Ledger number five with typical joy and enthusiasm. Stout didn't know what hit him, as he was showered with affection, Italian style. 2011 proved especially hard for Dittori, who landed just 72 winners all year. The season started well, as Rewilding won the Prince of Wales' stakes. Frankie gave the Colt a fantastic ride in getting the better of Coolmore's 11-4 on favourite, So You Think. So You Think came from Australia with this massive reputation. And the same old rivalry, Coolmore and Godolphin, the two best horses. And we locked horns. It was one of those epic races that I'm always very happy to rewatch it because I know I've won. Frankie Dottori, he's running down the Aussie champ and rewarding, gets up the win, the Prince of Wales stakes. However, the year was to end badly for Frankie with the news that Godolphin were on the hunt for fresh riding talent. Aged 41, Dittori started to feel the pressure as both Mikel Barcelona and Silvestre de Souza were invited to challenge for the Godolphin top job. The following year, the pressure was firmly on Frankie, who fought back with a notable big race win in the Ascot Gold Cup aboard the Saeed bin Sarur trained Colour Vision, beating Barcelona, who rode Mahmoud Al Zarouni's opinion pole. Opinion pole and colour vision. Barcelona on the near side of Dottori. And Dottori and colour vision is just in front. Colour vision will win the Gold Cup. This was a rare high for Dottori, as was his selection as torchbearer for the Olympic Games in London that summer. 10,000 people attended Ascot that day as Frankie's smile matched the national mood, but the dark clouds soon regathered. Later that year came the announcement that Godolphin and Frankie de Tori would go their separate ways at the end of the year. Together, they had won nine British classics, four King George VI and Queen Elizabeth stakes, three arcs and three Dubai World Cups. It was hard to believe, but just weeks later, far worse news was to hit de Tori. Ross Gallo have today announced their finding that Frankie de Tori has committed a breach of their rules relating to prohibited substances. I have spoken to Frankie since the announcement was made, and he has told me that he fully accepts Ross Gallo's decision. He also accepts that he has let down the sport he loves and all those associated with it, as well as the wider public. But most of all, and this is his greatest regret, he has let down his wife and children. Frankie would be out until May 2013. Whilst contrite in the immediate aftermath, he gave way to his lifelong love of celebrity in the limelight and it was announced he would spend the early part of his ban as a contestant on Celebrity Big Brother, joining the likes of Ryland Clark, footballer Razor Ruddock and Ryan Maloney, also known as Toady, from Australian soap Neighbours. Obviously I have to start back from scratch, it was hard to get good rides. I left Godolphin. People were, were too afraid to put me up. It took a while to get back into the system, I'll be honest with you, and it was tough. 
Struggling for rides, let alone winners, Dittori was thrown a lifeline by Qatar's Sheikh Joanne Al Thani, an ambitious young owner who dreamt big. Central to their plans of world domination was the remarkable race mare Trev. In the autumn, Frankie partnered Cricket Heads Philly for the first time in the Prix Vermeil, where a comfortable victory set her on course for a crack at the arc. However, just days before Longchamp, Frankie suffered a broken ankle. The ride on Trev went back to Thierry Janet, and together they won the arc in stunning style. In a further blow to Dittori, Janet retained the ride on Trev in the next year's arc, and with Frankie riding ruler of the world, Cricket Head star powered to her second victory. Frankie needed something special to click, and as 2015 approached, a reunion with old boss John Gosden would ignite Dittori's career once more. Great friends and teammates, Gosden still clearly felt that Frankie, now aged 44, had plenty left to give. And so began a golden era of success for Clarehaven Stables. Golden Horn won the 2015 Dante Stakes under William Buick and was immediately made favourite for the Derby, where Frankie took over in the saddle. Eight years after his first win on Authorised, who breezed clear, so too for Golden Horn, who barely broke sweat, and once more, Dittori was on top of the world. Golden Horn went on to have an amazing summer, and as we arrived in Paris that autumn, the main concerns for Frankie were his very wide draw in stall 14 and the presence of his former ride, Trev. A masterful Dittori, however, was unruffled. He stayed wide of the field, and when he rejoined the pack after half a mile, he was in a perfect position. Golden Horn now is answering every call from Frankie and it's Golden Horn who's going to win the arc. During this same period, American trainer Wesley Ward grew to be a huge supporter of De Tories. Undrafted came along in 2015 and together they won the Diamond Jubilee Stakes at Royal Ascot. Undrafted, brazen bow towards the near side, trying to peg him back. Undrafted wins the Diamond Jubilee under Frankie. The 2016 saw the climax of Frankie's relationship with Sheikh Joanne as Galileo Gold won the Qatari Royal, a first British classic, in the 2000 Guineas before following up in the St James's Palace Stakes. Galileo Gold in front, Autart McGurker in second and third places, but it's Galileo Gold and Frankie have won the St James's Palace. Wes Ward's Lady Aurelia announced herself on the big stage as she ripped apart the Queen Mary field one of the most breathtaking sights in recent Royal Ascot history. Lady Aurelia, I would say, was probably the most impressive tweet of wind that I ever had the Royal Ascot. She was a rocket. Lady Aurelia is absolutely home and hosed here seven or eight lengths in front. She's as good as her reputation said she might be, and Wesley Ward is going to have his seventh winner at Royal Ascot, and Frankie Dottori salutes the crowd. Frankie was back at the top table, but the next few years would see him reach new pinnacles with perhaps the best horse of his career, Enable. In 2017, there was no stopping Enable. She withstood the opposition to win the Oaks, and that was just the beginning of an utterly dominant campaign. And this fabulous filly, a dual Oaks winner, and now Enable as the King George, and a fifth win for Frankie Dottori. Come the autumn, Frankie was once again centre stage in the arc. In a fantastic climax to her three-year-old campaign, Enable barely turned a hair in shrugging aside Europe's best. Frankie Dottori is going to make history on this wonder filly, Enable. She's won it by two or three and easily. Other highlights in 2017 included a highly significant champion stakes win aboard Cracksman. With soft ground very much to his mount's liking, Frankie only had to steer and sit tight. A deeply impressive win. Cracksman opening up, four, five legs clear as they race up towards the line. And here is a champion. Cracksman wins the champion in fantastic style. Of all the great years together, 2018 must surely go down as one of the finest for the Dittori Gosden powerhouse. 
Enable and Cracksman were joined by several high-class teammates as Stradivarius, without parole, and Too Darn Hot all made giant strides. After an injury hit campaign, Enable arrived at the arc where she attempted to become only the eighth horse in history to win back-to-back -back editions of the race. Enable is in front, here's Sea of Glass in the yellow down the outside, she's flying at Enable and Frankie Dottori who have the lead, they come towards the line, Enable, she's done it just! You could tell that not the best preparation took his toll, but uh, look, she won an arc, what can I say, she's a superstar, I love her, I love her. Relief all round and a great achievement, but Enable responded so well to the events in Paris that thoughts soon turned to the challenge of the Breeders' Cup at Churchill Downs. Enable ran in the turf over a mile and a half and in a field 13 strong, only two really mattered. Enable and Magical and they're well clear of the others. Racing royalty, Enable and Frankie de Torre. The arc winner is the Breeders' Cup turf winner too. She conquered America, she done it. Cracksman also played a major part once again in a great season for Frankie. He was produced to devastating effect to record a second Champion Stakes victory. He's absolutely relentless. It's seven, eight less clear. Frankie saluting the crowd. A second Champion Stakes and what a champion he is. By now, another future star was into his third of seven racing seasons. As yet, Stradivarius hadn't really gelled with Frankie. However, the relationship really began to blossom when they took the Ascot Gold Cup. Stradivarius is narrowly in front. Stradivarius has won the Gold Cup. This was Frankie's 60th Royal Ascot winner, achieved in a year where things simply got better and better. 2019 was another fantastic year for Frankie and a year really dominated by Enable. She had four runs that season, starting with victory in the Coral Eclipse at Sandown. That set her up for a second attempt at the King George back at Ascot, a race that would go down in history for its epic finish. Enable near side, Crystal Ocean will not give in. They go head to head, toe to toe. She's just in front of Enable, racing up towards the line, and she'll win a second King George. What a race! That was a horse race. <laughs> go Enable, okay. go Enable, go! Not only she's a super mare, but she just showed what a courageous and will to win she's, she had. And, uh, you know, I don't want too many races like that because I'm absolutely exhausted. You know, my career is probably the hardest and most fourth big race that I ever had. Enable had set herself up for Paris once more with all eyes on the arc. This was a treble attempt that the whole racing world wanted to witness. Against Enable was the falling rain which hit Paris all weekend and the track became very soft and sticky. Although Enable showed all of her class and courage, the fact was she couldn't produce her very best in those conditions. Despite briefly looking set to create history, she and her rider couldn't repel Volgeist in the surge to the line. And it's Enable in front, she leads. Volkgeist in second place is closing down the centre. Volkgeist in the red jacket is getting up, he's won. Earlier that summer, there was the same going concern for Stradivarius as the rain had set in before his attempt for a second victory in the Ascot Gold Cup. However, the ground became irrelevant and the result inevitable as, on this day, Frankie was riding at the top of his game. The Italian rattled off a quick-fire treble in the opening three races. Ayali won the opening Norfolk Stakes before Sangarius followed up in the Hampton Court and then star catcher took the Ribblesdale. This man isn't even naive, I thought. This, this is can happen. First three winners. You can take a breath for relief now. You can move on and uh, get all nervous about Stratavarius. Although there was slight anxiety in the race as he found himself boxed in turning for home, De Torre soon found daylight Stradivarius quickened and the race was over. Stradivarius, this sensational style, Frankie on fire, Stradivarius wins again.
Can you possibly? Can you, can you can possibly? You can this can do can what? Listen, I'm on the Gold Cup. What do you want? What more do you want? First, Unbelievable. First four winners at yeah. uh, Ascot Gold Cup. They are unbelievable. Listen, let's not take the shine away from the horse. He's yeah. an amazing horse. He's got a heart bigger than his yeah. body, and uh, he's great for the public. Everybody's latched onto him. There, everybody loves him, including me. He was nearly as good as when I won the seven. The feeling. I mean, I was on cloud nine. Once the crowds get behind me, then I, I can turn it up. And it was electric, electric, I must say. It was uh, one of those days that I will never forget. As a six-year-old, Enable returned in 2020 for what would be her final season. She had already posted her name alongside both Dahlia and Swain as a two-time winner of Ascot's King George, and whilst this attempt at an unprecedented third win was slightly subdued owing to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was still thrilling to witness. This magnificent mare, a mare in a million, a mare in ten million, one of the great champions of the sport, and for an able, it's King George III. Amazing, look, never been done with it before, freaking George's. I am over the moon, bit of knot on my throat, I must say, bit emotional about it because she's special. She would now have one more run back in Paris for a final treble attempt in the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe. But maybe now, after a career spanning five seasons, the end was in sight. Enable was sent off an odds-on favourite, but the ground was again very loose. And they're away. Whilst she arrived to challenge over two furlongs out, looking dangerous, she was bumped when coming under pressure and her chance was gone in seconds as Sotsas powered away. Enable try, but she's not going to get there. It is Sotsas in front, Christian de Mero now. Sotsas has won it. A few weeks later, Judmont confirmed Enable's retirement from racing and one of the great partnerships between horse and rider was at an end. Earlier that summer, Frankie's other great ally, Stradivarius, had continued his domination of the staying division. If his previous 2019 win in the Ascot Gold Cup was hard fought, his third win in the 2020 renewal was a performance of power and destruction. And now Frankie says go on Stradivarius and it's an immediate response and he quickens right away from the F road. Six legs, eight legs, he's going to be ten legs, he's going to absolutely streak them. The best stayer in the world, Stradivarius, three goal cups. It is an amazing achievement. Tolly, uh, Sagada and Yates managed to win three. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll try for the Yates record next year. So a wonderful feeling and I'm, I'm very proud of the horse. 2020 also saw John Gosden's Palace Pier emerge as a top-class miler. He announced his arrival at the top level when winning the St James's Palace Stakes. A three-way go in the St James's Palace and Palace Pier is getting up in the last few strides and Palace Pier wins. This success was a third on the day for Frankie, having earlier won the Queen Mary on Campanelle and the Coronation Stakes aboard Alpine Star. There may have been no crowd at Ascot, but Frankie was once again thrilling race fans the world over. He ended the week as leading rider at the Royal Meeting for the seventh and final time. Come the spring of 2021, and with De Tory having turned 50, he gained an unexpected but clear-cut 20th British Classic when Mother Earth won the 1,000 guineas for Aidan O'Brien. Classic number 20 swiftly became number 21, this time in the Oaks. Frankie picked up the spare ride on Snowfall, who loved the mud, and recorded a stunning record 16-length victory. This success meant Frankie equaled the legendary Fred Archer's record of 21 British Classic wins. The high-profile winners from the Jordan Gosden stable also continued to flow, but the one the whole team and the public wanted was a fourth Ascot Gold Cup success for Stradivarius, which would equal Yates's feat achieved in 2009. Good morning, everyone. Thursday Gold Cup day. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for all the best wishes for me and Strad. Fingers crossed. We're going to give it our best shot. However, it wasn't to be for Frankie and Stradivarius, who had to settle for fourth place, behind the front-running winner, Subjectivist. 
Here's Stradivarius against the rail. He's in fourth position. He's in third position. He has a lot of ground to make up on subjectivist. Subjectivist Joe Fanning stole the race heading into the home straight. Subjectivist wins by a good distance. Elsewhere, Palace Pier was back and taking the mile division by storm. He entered Royal Ascot, a red-hot favourite for the Queen Anne Stakes, and he did not disappoint. This success moved Frankie above the great Pat Edery into second place in the all-time Royal Ascot winners list, behind only Lester Piggott, a source of much pride for the Italian. We always looked up to Pat, you know, we were next to me in the jockey room. Gentleman, fierce competitor, yeah, it was a big moment. He was uh, a show favourite, he was the banker of, of the meat for me, and and he fully obliged. It's a two-length lead for Palace Pier, races towards the line, and Palace Pier is the winner of the Queen Anne. As he entered 2022, Frankie was still catching the eye in the biggest races, particularly on the international stage. And he made the perfect start to the year as he won a fourth Dubai World Cup aboard Bob Baffert's Country Grammar. Country Grammar with his date with destiny in front a length and a half. Country Grammar won the Dubai World Cup. Mixed emotions, it's been 15 years I've won this race. What can I say, uh, a dream come true. A little bit emotional, to be honest with you, especially that last furlong, which once I knew I was going to win, I thought, oh my God, this is, this, is, this is not true. And I'm winning the World Cup again at my age. Fantastic. For once, Royal Ascot was not a happy hunting ground for Frankie. Rather, he had a miserable time. Winless over the first two days, it was once again down to Dittori's great old warrior Stradivarius to try again in the Gold Cup. Frankie got locked up at a vital stage by the winner Kiprios and Princess Zoe and eventually had to switch widest of all to challenge. Although beaten just over a length into third place, the post-race tension between Dittori and Gosden in the unsadly enclosure was clear for all to see. As part of the fallout to the Gold Cup, Gosden announced that he and Dittori would be taking a sabbatical, during which time Frankie took a quick holiday in Italy. However, after a few weeks and clear-the-air talks, Frankie and Gosden were reunited and the partnership was soon back in business at Ascot. Emily Upjohn shrugged off a disappointing effort in the King George and returned to the track on British Champions Day with a powerful victory in the Fillion Mare. Ascot continued to rekindle Frankie's spark when Kinross fired home in the sprint for Rafe Beckett. The perfect end to a challenging season. In December 2022, racing received the news it had long feared as the sport's public face announced his intention to retire at the end of 2023. The farewell tour schedule was already in place and the first steps into a new and final year would be taken in the California sunshine. A new challenge would begin at Santa Anita on Boxing Day. A driving finish in the wishing well, outside Big Summer and Freedom Flyer. Freedom Flyer fought them all off. And what a day for Frankie Dettori who's putting on a show that's his fourth winner of the day. That highly successful winter spell riding in California was a strong clue as to what was to follow in the summer months. Frankie wasted no time at all securing classic glory aboard Caldine in the 2000 Guineas at Newmarket. This was his fourth victory in the race and following the contest, Caldine's trainer Andrew Balding declared Frankie as racing's omnipresent superstar. It appeared that every time Frankie sat on a horse at the start of this dizzying summer, something special was likely to happen. And that feeling continued when Emily Upjohn cruised to victory in the Coronation Cup. An hour later, Soul Sister capped a memorable afternoon for Frankie when winning the Oaks. This was his seventh success in the race and his 23rd British Classic winner, leaving him just seven shy of Lester Piggott's all-time British Classic record of 30 wins. The next day, Frankie took his final ride in the derby, aboard arrest. However, the fast going was to be the undoing of his mount, who finished 10th, and another door on Frankie's career closed gently shut. So to his final Royal Ascot. For much of his career, this meeting had been Frankie's playground. Entering the week, he'd ridden 77 winners at the Royal Meeting, with only the legendary Lester Piggott above him in the all-time winner's table. 
Day one, however, did not go to script. In Spiral in the Queen Anne Stakes, Caldine in the St James's Palace Stakes, and Absurd in the Copper Horse Handicap, all finished second to mark a frustrating opening day for Frankie. But with his usual resilience and steely tough determination, he found a way to bounce back when Gregory gave him Royal Ascot winner 78 in the following day's Queen's Vars. Gregory finding plenty under the Dottori drive. Frankie's farewell at Royal Ascot and it's winner number 78 at the Royal Meeting for the Italian. For a split second when I got the further mark and she came, I thought, God, not second again. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, it dug deep for me and it galloped right to the line. For my personal you know, things, great to get one on the, on the board for my last Royal Ascot and uh, after day one and at nearly the end of day two, I thought, God, is this winner going to come this year? We're going to end up with no winners, but good. Uh, delighted, got a good reception. Now I'm chasing 80, so two more if I can. An extraordinary, written in the Stars' ninth Ascot Gold Cup followed the next day as Courage Mon Ami gained victory ahead of Coltrane. Courage Mon Ami, though, under Frankie, just proving the stronger on the run for the line. And Courage Mon Ami, under Frankie, has won the Gold Cup. I didn't expect it. Look, the last five years at Stradivarius, so the pressure was on. This one, on my last year winning the Gold Cup, uh, I actually had a... Uh, Myself, the King and Queen Camilla, we had a talk beforehand, then uh, the next race I go on and win the Gold Cup and he presents the trophy, so amazing, I mean, really amazing. 31 years after Frankie won for the first time aboard Drum Taps, and 12 months after his ride on Stradivarius, which had put his riding and his racing relationships under intense scrutiny, a sensational way to bounce back and there was more to come. The following day, Porta Fortuna won the Albany Stakes for Joseph O'Brien. This was a milestone 80th Royal Ascot winner for Frankie de Tori, a number he yearned to reach. Frankie nudging away, Coppice in front, Frankie on fire on his farewell, Coppice wins the Sandringham. Later that afternoon, Coppice took the Sandringham handicap, giving Frankie his 81st and final Royal Ascot winner in what had been a special week. I'm so tired. <laughs> this week has been so hard, but I loved it. Yeah, you know, I'm sure that I will be sad in a couple of days. By the moment, I'm just too tired to cry. <laughs> in August, and in the very twilight of his career, came what were, arguably, two of Frankie's finest ever rides. The first of them came in France, as Inspiral attempted back-to-back -back wins in the Prix Jacques Le Marois at Deauville where things were made difficult as she had been handed a tough draw in stall one. Marvel again at Dittori dropping in spiral in before switching her across to the far side of the pack. Once in position, her finishing kick was as true as ever. In spiral comes through and grabs Big Rock and it's in spiral and Frankie Dittori in spiral bounds away to win it. A great performance by horse and rider, one which was witnessed by the great Yves Saint-Martin. After the race, the leading French jockeys all paid tribute to Frankie and his career with an emotional show of gratitude. It's hard not to cry. Um, I'm very happy. Amazing. Stuff for dreams, really, you know, to win your last one. Yeah, and you heard the public. Fantastic. I'm a bit of a knot now, to be honest with you. This top-class ride was swiftly followed by another, this time back in the United Kingdom at York. Shadwell's retained rider Jim Crowley was banned for the Ebor meeting, so the ride on their runaway Royal Ascot winner, Mostadaf, came Frankie's way in the Judmont International. De Tori produced a masterclass in front running, executing the fractions to perfection, a skill he had learned all those years ago when wintering in America. Frankie was brilliant on his last trip to York. He even made light of a terrible draw in the Ebor handicap itself, riding absurd to a narrow victory. Absurdly good riding. As summer turned to autumn, Frankie hoped for one more British Classic winner. His final attempt would take place in the presence of royalty, as their majesties the King and Queen visited Doncaster to see Desert Hero line up against Frankie and his mount arrest in the St. Ledger. 
and making his bid for glorious continuous arrest is chasing him down in second place but Ryan Moore and continuous are pouring it on in the closing stages here arrest and Frankie can't do anything about it and continuous takes us at ledger oh unbelievable I got a reception like I thought was Ronaldo walking into the paddock having the king of the queen here is fantastic you know, he's our oldest classic, and I don't think I've seen Doncaster this packed. Great atmosphere, and uh, yeah, it's been a, a good day. The farewell tour then rode into Paris, where Frankie took his final arc ride aboard Free Wind. Although he could only finish down the field behind Ace Impact, his final tally of six arc winners saw him exit Longchamp, the most successful jockey in Europe's premier race. Wow! And then, with the end in sight, came one final twist of the Vittori tale. On the 12th of October, in a stunning new turn, the Italian announced he would ride on. He would move to America and extend his career indefinitely as a full-time US-based jockey. <laughs> Frankie's departure from these shores marks the end of an era for British racing. And his name will be remembered forever as one of the very greatest of all time.